I rise today to speak about Christmas, but what Christmas is like for single parents, other people trying to, people trying to survive on other income supports such as below the poverty line on Newstart and those of low income. These people don't necessarily look forward to Christmas because it is a very vulnerable time of year for them. Not only are they having to, they're having to deal with what could be a bleak Christmas, but they're also looking at what the future holds for them over the next 12 months. It is with great sadness that I, again, in this place, draw attention to the fact that we have a large group of Australians who are living below the poverty line who can't look forward to um, a Christmas that can share joyfully with their children, but are yet again wondering how to make ends meet. Just before I spoke about an issue similar to this at this time of year last year, it was when single parents in Australia were facing being dumped onto Newstart. Unfortunately, that has now been a reality for those single parents and their families for 12 months, and it's not a pretty picture, let me tell you. Last year, um, we were deeply concerned about what the future held for those single parents and their families because they were dumped onto the new start, which is up to $120 a week um, below what they were trying to survive on, on parenting payments single. What, how are these parents um, doing now? How are their family, families doing now? Unfortunately, the government can't tell us because and I admit that the original, well, we all know it's a complicated story. The Howard government first dumped the first group of single parents onto, um, onto Newstart, then the um, Labor government jumped, dumped another lot of those grandfathered parents onto single parents. But there's been no systematic monitoring or review of how this, these changes are um, impacting on these single parents, most of whom are single mothers. While some have um, managed to moved into work, we don't know anything about the appropriateness of that work, whether they are holding down a number of jobs, which I know from a couple of examples uh, they are doing, to make ends meet, how, much, how many of them had to give up study, um, who's looking after their children while, we, while they've um, had, to go, had to take on uh, more working hours. We do know most families are living in poverty. We do know that these families are living on Newstart and that means that they are living significantly below the poverty line. As the school holidays approach, I know that most families, single parent families, are contemplating how they care for their children and continue to work. The briefing note from the Productivity Commission released last Friday showed that for a family on a minimum wage, the cost of putting a single child into all day care is 9% of their disposable income. Of course, these are parents that are living um, below uh, the minimum wage, in, uh, or um, if they're only working part-time. Many single parents can't afford to put their children into childcare during the school holidays. So those that are lucky enough to be able to find work and be able to juggle between their working commitments and their parenting commitments don't know what to do during the school holidays. I know some that actually have to give up work because they don't have anybody that can care or they don't have adequate um, or satisfactory caring arrangements. So is it back onto New Start, back into that poverty, back into trying to find more work after the school holidays. A single mother rang my office just last week, desperate and I must say depressed, to tell me that she'd decided not to pay the rent that week or the coming week, because the kids needed to be fed. This is the choice that she had to make. She had to choose between paying the rent or feeding the children. And of course, if this new government has its way, because it's been talking about wanting to expand income management into new areas, it's carrying out an urgent review of this failed policy, those are one of the indicators for vulnerability is housing. So because a single parent can't pay their rent because they have to feed their kids, that would automatically come up as a vulnerability indicator and that single parent might be subject to income management in that brave new world of expanding income management. With the lack of government monitoring since last year about the impact of this policy on single parents, their families and community services that they've had to rely on for support, I made a point of actually going out and speaking to charity and community organisations about the impact that parenting parent parenting payment cuts have had. In my home state of Western Australia, 
undertook a survey of providers um, about uh, how they were going this year, had they had an increase in the pressures on the um, number of people calling on their services. All but four organisations out of 31 um, spoke of that the demand of, for their services had increased during 2013. Almost half said that they had been un, unable to meet the, this, this demand. They identified housing affordability, access to mental health services and inadequacy of income support payments as the top priorities for government action. These are areas in which we need the government to be showing leadership. Just today there are reports of charities in, in my home state, again of Western, Australia, of Western Australia, experiencing a high demand for assistance as we approach Christmas. Food Bank has found a 9% 9% increase in the number of people looking for food donations this year compared to last year. The Salvos have said some requests may need to be turned down. This is the reality that single parents face this Christmas. We know that, the, the, in general, the request, uh, uh, I think it's a third of the requests for help um, from Food Bank in mean, their past reports have been um, from single parent families. It's fair to assume that that increase in demand, that there are also single parent families in there. For many, the new year is shaping up to be even harder. All the signs from the government are that there will be that more and more areas um, of, that are currently provide assistance and support to um, those on New Start, single parent families and to those, on, uh, those uh, low income families will be hit by budget cuts. As a result, these house, their household budgets that are already stretched past a breaking point um, will be under even more pressure. Let's look at some of them. There's the school kids bonus, which is one of the cuts the government's looking to make um, as it um, contemplates um, or as it proposes to get rid of the uh, mining resource rent, uh, the mining tax. We know that education is absolutely fundamental to children's well-being and their well-being at being as an adult. As an adult, we know that education is a critical part of of getting out of living in poverty. After the Christmas break and summer holidays, and the return the return to school is a tough time for many parents, particularly those uh, single parent families. And we know last year that single parents were being advised when they were being dumped onto Newstart to rely on their school bonus, the school kids' bonus, to help them get by to pay the bills. The reality is that cost of uniforms, books, fees, uh, school fees, sports fees, um, sporting activities, and the other usual costs associated with education are, ha are, are hard to bear if you're on low incomes. They're even harder if you're a single parent trying to get by on very little money. This cut will, help, will hurt the most vulnerable members of our community, the very children that we are supposed to be. Everybody says that they are committed to helping not live in poverty. It's a complete farce if the government says that they are trying to look after people in our community and yet are cutting the very payments that these people um, that are living in poverty uh, 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 survive on and rely on. The school kids bonus is one of the three areas of support and assistance that are being cut back as the government moves to abolish um, the mining tax. And rather than working to ensure Australians benefit from our natural resources, um, they are putting the uh, multinationals before the most vulnerable of our community. The mining tax repeal is also responsible for another cut, and that shows a real, um, I believe, uh, under, undercurrent of the cruelness of the approach that's being taken, and that is the axing of the income support bonus. This has been described as this, this has been described to help people on certain income support payments prepare for unexpected living costs. At the moment, this payment is $105.80 if you're single and it's paid twice a year. This amounts, as I've said in the chamber when it was passed in the first place, that it's less than a, um, less than a cup of coffee a week. I acknowledge that. But when you are living below the poverty line, when you are robbing Peter to pay Paul each week and making those decisions about whether you pay the rent or put food on the table, that every cent is essential. That money comes in, that it comes into a budget that is so desperately thin that it help, that, that helps 
and yet it's going to be taken away. It is not insignificant to the people that are trying to survive on so little amount of money. Then, of course, we have the low income superannuation contribution, which the government is all, has also said they're going to cut, and that's designed to help low and fixed, uh, those on low and fixed incomes under $37,000 a year and to help them build up even a modest amount of um, money um, for their retirement. It will have a disproportionately a disproportionate effect on women. The Industry Super, Industry Super Australia has said that axing the rebate will affect around 2 million working women, including 80 per cent of female part-time workers. How can you expect people to be financially secure and independent in their retirement if they are stuck in poverty, living below the poverty line or living close to the poverty line, and yet they deprive them of opportunities um, to save in their super? Again, hitting the most vulnerable members of our community. Older, um, for older parents and for job seekers, it's not just um, the younger members of, the, um, of our community that I'm talking about. Um, and they're not just the only ones that are at threat from this poor policy making. If you look at some of the information that was received during questioning and estimates, it shows that there's been a 28 per cent increase in the number of Australians aged over 50 um, who, are, who have um, been on Newstart since 2010. There's a noticeable jump in these figures, which coincides with the January payment, payment cuts, the single parent payment cuts, that is. On top of that, there's the reality that many traditional industries, such as manufacturing, are in decline. So we've got workers that have been um, forced out of employment without a strong set of transferable skills into a different, uh, into a different industry. But you've got, again, a group of um, single parents in particular here. We know that jumps associated with that um, single parents being first forced onto a new start. Now, these people that are aged, aged over 50, over 50 um, in the workplace, older workers are being subject to age discrimination um, and, and ageism. They're not getting the adequate support in to be able to develop their skills and training and they face um, that meets their needs and they face many multiple and significant barriers to employment and that at present the job services simply aren't meeting their needs their needs. They are left stuck on new start for extended periods of time. That of course means that they are living in poverty and it also particularly means that they aren't able to build up um, uh, savings and super contribution for their retirement. So, in other words, potentially this group of people is stuck permanently in poverty without an opportunity um, to um, get out of it. If we don't address the issues around New Start, ensuring that people aren't living in poverty, remembering that it's New Start is $134 uh, below the poverty line. We need to be making sure we're increasing New Start, improving job services, and tackling front on ageism and age discrimination. Another issue that is, that, um, is facing uh, those people living on low income and older workers and single parents are those that are living in um, mobile residences in what they call uh, uh, lifestyle parks. Um, and, and some caravan parks where they have these permanent, uh, permanent mobile residences. Um, and it, this is happening around Australia, but I've also had a lot of contact from people, in particular in my home state of Western Australia, from Bustleton. Um, many of the regional centres have these particular areas because it's cheaper to live there as well. But they've, they've got notices earlier in the year which they were very upset about from the actual owners of the, of the villages and saying the ATO is presently considering or presently it has a draft ruling that would see the GST charged on rents paid by residences in lifestyle villages and similar accommodation significantly increased because they're talking about moving the GST from 4.5 per cent to 10 per cent. And of course this is um, uh, deeply concerning to them because people live in these villages or these um, residences, mobile residences, because they are cheaper, because they can't afford to live in um, to live in uh, other accommodation. The report suggests that there are 10,000 people that are living in these homes around Australia and the proposed change would see residents paying an increase of rent between $15 and $30 per week, forcing people, of course, to make cuts in areas such as food, healthcare, um, community involvement. These are, very, these are significant 
to those people that are trying to survive on the pension Senator or Seward, trying to survive on the